This is Peter Goldsmith, the uh, principal investigator uh, and director of the uh, Soybean Innovation Lab, and wanted to welcome you to our webinar on uh, building the network of soy dairy processing enterprises. I hope you guys are doing well, um, and it's glad to. We're so glad to to offer this and and have you on the, uh, at at the webinar. Uh, we've got a uh, tremendous panel here for you to um, uh, cover um, the topic from a variety of angles. Uh, this will be the first of um, a number of webinars uh, involving the uh, uh, soy dairy uh, network that is that we're building. Um, and uh, so there are a lot of uh, entrepreneurs out there, and uh, so it's an exciting start. Let me explain a little bit about the Soybean Innovation Lab, uh, just so you know who we are uh, and how to get a hold of us. And after I give a little introduction, then I'll uh, hand off to um, uh, Crystal Montes de Oca, who will um, uh, moderate uh, the, the webinar and introduce the panelists, and, and, and away we go. So let me tell you a little bit about the Soybean Innovation Lab. Uh, we are in our third year, and this is an effort by the U.S. government to explore and understand better the role of soybean for reducing poverty and malnutrition. There's a lot of interest in soybean in the tropics. Uh, there's a lot of growth in uh, demand for soybean in the tropics. and uh, the Soybean Innovation Lab, the team, uh, we are about 30 uh, researchers uh, here um, in the U.S., uh, Canada, and, and in Europe, and about 30 partners in uh, Africa, Asia, and uh, South America. So it's a large group of knowledgeable people uh, supporting the development of soy. And our role is to provide the technical information to help those who want to develop soybean. In this case, in this webinar, these are uh, uh, enterprises, uh, entrepreneurs uh, funded by a, an NGO or a donor. And we're in the background. And people like Crystal and Marilyn at heart uh, provide uh, we provide the technical information uh, to ensure that the soy dairy business is sustainable. So that's our role. But we cover a lot of things. This is on uh, soy for human nutrition, this webinar, but we also do a lot of work on soy uh, 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 plant breeding, uh, soy uh, agronomics and production, uh, soy for livestock feed and in livestock nutrition, uh, a lot of research and trying to understand the role of women to adopt soy and small holders as they integrate soy. So we cover the entire value chain. That's what the government has asked us to do. And we partner. Everything we do is with a partner uh, in the, the, the home country or the home region. Uh, so we, we don't operate alone, we, we operate in partnership. Uh, let me uh, show you the, uh, the soy dairy processing, and maybe Dan would move to um, the next slide. Um, uh, the idea of soy for human nutrition uh, is at least, I mean, it's been many, many years, but really formalized and, and people working uh, added at, say, Malnutrition Matters, the National Soybean Research Laboratory, and other organizations um, for uh, you know, approximately 20 years. And uh, one area, very exciting area, is the area of processing soybean, uh, turning it into soy milk, and from that, uh, a variety of products fall out from that. And of course, uh, Marilyn will, Dr. Nash will, will cover that. This is a map of uh, where currently there are soy dairy processing units uh, that we're able to account for around the world. Uh, so there are a lot in 
South and Central America, um, Africa, and, and Asia. Um, the idea being that, that soy for human nutrition is obviously very important to address uh, malnutrition, but it also is an economic engine for entrepreneurship and regional economic development uh, because these are manufacturing units. Um, and uh, maybe shift to the next slide, Dan. Um, and because there are so many uh, entrepreneurs and units out there, the interest is very, very high. One of the questions and, and, and uh, responsibilities of the Soybean Innovation Lab is to help these uh, organizations, donors, entrepreneurs become successful. Uh, and this is more than just a technology. The technology is very important on how to convert a soybean into milk. And that's, that's not an easy task, and, and there's a lot of uh, technical training that goes on. But these are within businesses, and these have to be sustainable businesses. And so we work very hard um, to help these entrepreneurs be, be, create and establish sustainable businesses. So that involves many more things in addition to the technology. So the network is a virtual network, a collection of, of entrepreneurs and soy cows all over the world uh, where we provide a variety of services to them. We share information, they share information, they provide uh, new opportunities, new, new ideas, technical training, new foods, uh, new new products resulting, packaging, packaging technology is very important, uh, market assessment, many, many things um, that the network can then support these uh, soy businesses. And these soy businesses, you have to realize, often are very isolated, that a cow is placed in a community or in a city, and there aren't other soy entrepreneurs necessarily in the region, and that's where the network is very important. I'm going to stop there and hand it back over to Crystal, but we very much, those interested in joining the soy network, um, uh, please follow up. Uh, we have a website, the Soybean Innovation Lab has a website, uh, and we have a Twitter feed, and, and we'll provide all that, those links to you but do contact us. We're here to help you, the soy entrepreneurs, the donor organizations, be successful. There's a lot of talent um, and, um, uh, and out there to, to help you, and, and, and that's what we've been asked to do. Before I hand it off to Crystal, let me add that uh, if you have questions, uh, this is a webinar, please chat them in. There's a little chat box. For me, it's on the lower right-hand side of my control panel, um, and you can just type in the question. We have people handling the questions, and they will then, um, um, when we go to the Q&A or at the appropriate mo moment, Crystal will ask the question of the appropriate speaker. So enjoy the uh, webinar. We look forward to getting to know you uh, later in, in, in building a, a strong network. And Crystal, I'll let you introduce the speakers. Great. OK. Yeah. <laughs> I muted myself. Uh, great. So I'm Crystal Matas de Oca, and I work with the Soybean Innovation Lab, and I'm on the Soy for Human Nutrition team. And we have also Dr. Marilyn Nash, who is on the soybean, um, who works with NSRL, and she is, which is the National Soybean Research Lab and she coordinates domestic and international nutrition programs. She also does recipe development, kitchen training, nutrition analysis, and food safety and hygiene training. She's the lead for the Soybean Innovation Lab's uh, Soy for Human Nutrition effort, research efforts, and um, together we work on implementing of dairy, soy dairy systems in Ghana and Mozambique, and she also conducts research on soy adaption at the household level and research efforts to develop a low processing soybean. Um, and so Dr. Marilyn Ash, thanks. And then we also have Hart 
Jansen, who is the president of Mal Magician Matters. It's a Canadian nonprofit dedicated to sustainable, low cost food technologies for malnutrition, primarily by using soy, also grains, fruits, and vegetables. Um, these plant based foods offer the greatest nutritional and environmental and economic benefits. Currently, they have over 270 soy cows installed around the world with the majority in Africa and Asia. And then we have Elizabeth Parisi and Pedro Manrique from the Soy Based Nutrition Program, PNBS, in Colombia, which was started by the Bogota Laurelis Rotary Club. Uh, PNBS is a Colombian nonprofit dedicated to diminishing malnutrition levels in Colombia with a highly efficient and self sustainable model. They do this by implementing and continually optimizing their soy based nutrition program in targeted malnutrition communities. They currently have over 140 soy cows in Colombia, a few in El Salvador, Guatemala, and Peru. And they also helped Peru launch their own version of PNBS through a Rotary Club there. And they have over 118 soy cows. And they're also in the process of setting up projects in Mexico. Um, great. So with that, uh, welcome everyone. And Marilyn, if you're ready, you can start your presentation on the benefits of soy for human nutrition. Well, it is a pleasure to be here to discuss some benefits of soy consumption for human benefit, for human nutrition. Um, so soy as a food is really great due to its adaptability to local cuisine and its affordability as an ingredient. But my focus today is to touch on some of the nutritional benefits of using soy. Soy brings protein to um, the menu and it can be critical for us as protein needs to be consumed regularly. Protein is one of the three macronutrients that our bodies need and we need to we should be consuming it every day and we need it in sufficient amounts to support our body's growth and, and maintenance. Protein is in our muscles, blood cells, bones, skin. It's really everywhere in our body and ideally we should consume high quality protein every day. We get protein from the foods we eat and most people know that meat, milk, eggs um, will supply us with, hold on, oh, did I just, okay. Um, we get protein from the foods we eat. Most people know that meat, milk, and eggs will supply us with the, this very important nutrient. Um, but soy foods also provide protein. And here you see how various soy products on the right compare with other foods that are rich in protein on the left. Um, while raw soybeans start off with about 38% protein, processing to make soy into food products means those products vary in protein content. Uh, but looking at total protein in a food may not tell the complete story. And when you consider the amount of protein in your diet, you also need to look at the quality of the protein. And this is going to vary among our foods. These differences start with the amounts of amino acids that are present in a food. And the amino acids are really just the building blocks that make up our proteins. Um, our body uses those amino acids to, they, they reassemble them in different uh, orders to make different proteins. Uh, different amino acids put together uh, in different ways create different proteins with very different functions. There are 21 total amino acids and nine of those are considered essential. And essential just means that our bodies cannot make those aminos, those amino acids, and so it is essential that we consume them or eat them regularly. Um, soy happens to have all of the essential amino acids in it, and so many will call soy a high quality, soy, uh, high quality protein because of this. Um, just having a good amino acid balance is not enough. Our body must be able to digest and absorb the amino acids. And soy's amino acids happen to be very um, highly digestible. Both of these food qualities measures, the amino acid balance and the digestibility, are captured in a score uh, that the food industry calls the PDCAS, or Protein Dispersibility Corrected Amino Acid Score. The score goes from zero to one, with one being a protein, uh, food with a protein of the highest qu um, quality. Um, this chart compares proteins from common foods. Um, you see uh, 
egg whites are considered the gold standard or the ideal protein source. They contain all the essential amino acids and highly digestible, highly digestible, and they're given a score of one. A casein, which is the protein found in milks, a cow's milk is also scored one. Um, meats are usually fairly high. Um, and you see soybean is very unique in that it has a range of 0 0.8 to 1. Um, and this is because soy is so versatile and it can be processed in many forms and that processing affects the soy quality. So soy protein isolate is the most purified form of soy protein and it has a score as good as egg whites or a 1. Whole cooked soybeans have a score of 0 0.8. So processed soy is a high quality protein with all the essential amino acids and those amino acids are in a form that are digestible. Um, another reason to look at soy as a protein source is its affordability. Um, this slide compares the commodity products by cost per metric ton in the left column of numbers and then the cost per pound of protein in the right column. And even though soy flour originally looks to be more costly than um, other vegetable sources of protein like lentils and peanuts, the soy flour ends up really being the most affordable commodity when you look at the cost per quantity of protein that's delivered. And another consideration is often the lack of local availability for many non-soy protein foods, and I'm thinking especially meat, milk, and eggs. Um, local soybean production and small-scale processing, like is being promoted and worked with um, through the Soybean Innovation Lab, um, end up being excellent ways of um, providing a source of protein. So just, looking, um, so just looking at soy dairy processing of soybeans, the most obvious product to be made is soy milk. And with about 3.5% protein, we get 4 grams protein per 8 ounces of soy milk. And this is a great beverage, but it is also um, a great substitute when you're uh, cooking, um, if you want to substitute out the soy dairy, the dairy milk. Yogurt and tofu are value-added products that can be made from the soy milk with additional processing steps. Soy yogurt yields about 3% protein or 4 grams protein for every 8 ounces of yogurt. Yogurt can be a tasty, thick beverage, or it can be thickened and eaten, even eaten with a spoon. Tofu processing really concentrates the protein. This gives about 11% protein in a, uh, by weight, and that's about 6 grams of protein for just 2 ounces of tofu. And a tofu can be added to soups and stews, and you can fry it. You can mash it, slice it, cube it, and it will take on almost all the flavors um, of the other cooking ingredients that are in a recipe. And finally, the residue from soybeans that are processed from, into soy milk is called okara, and it still has protein in it. It is a moist ground byproduct um, that can be air dried, and it is often used in livestock feeds, but it also can be added to our soups and stews and even put into some of our baked products. Uh, protein levels in okara are going to vary depending on the pressing of the soy milk from the okara, Whoop. but it can vary from between 35 to 7%. So soy dairies can be an effective way of bringing soy and soy proteins into places that need affordable and high quality protein foods. Where stunting and wasting is of concern, early interventions with added calories and protein is critical. For children, this is especially true for, for children during that time um, when young toddlers are transitioning from breast milk to other foods. For children in orphanages, daycares, or in the home, soy milk, tofu, and yogurt can be a delicious addition to the daily diet. Uh, for toddlers, tofu is a very soft food, so it's a very easily digested. It can be eaten as is by young children, or it could be cooked um, with other traditional flavors. Of course, providing soy milk as a beverage is always okay, as long as it does not become a substitute for breast milk or a more nutrient-based formula. Children of speech can benefit from, by drinking soy milk each day, and often this is done through an organized school feeding program. Uh, benefits of such a program um, can include increased attendance, especially among girls. Uh, teachers tell us that sh student attentiveness and energy levels become improved when they have this uh, daily snack. Um, Long-term growth is better supported with daily protein and calories. So soy, soy milk brought to the schools in bulk or single portion bags or containers can work very well. 
The emphasis here should be on consumption at the school, so we know the children are the ones benefiting from the extra, um, the extra food. Um, and the risk of spoilage then is uh, spoilage is minimized. Finally, these products are ideal for small-scale commercial enterprises, which is a topic being covered by another speaker. So this is just a very brief summary of some of the benefits for soy and human nutrition, and I want to thank you for your attention, and I'll stand by to see if there are any questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, Okay, well, I have a couple questions. Okay. Uh, well, can you, I know that you do soy for human uh, nutrition, soybean utilization training. So if you could maybe just like briefly explain that a little bit and why it's important. Well, um, in many places that are especially, well, even even here in the U.S. where we're not new to soybeans, um, there, there seems to be a real mystery in how to go about using soybeans. Mm -hmm. um, they're, they're quite commonly uh, first adopted as a livestock diet, and so the idea of using it in, a, in, a, in the home or uh, cooking with it can feel foreign. So, um, we, uh, so what we normally would do is kind of we, we have the very basic processing steps that can be done on a very small scale to make things like a soy flour, soy milk, tofu, um, things that, are, um, that can be done on a, on a household level. Um, and we also, um, so we have the kind of basic processing steps, and then the real trick is to go into a community um, with their own cuisine, their own culture, and watch how they're already cooking, uh, learn about uh, uh, what kind of flavor profiles they like, and then uh, work directly with the people there in the village or in, in the community to show them how to adapt what they're already doing by incorporating enough soy uh, soybeans to actually make a nutritional impact. Um, we often will marry those um, hands-on uh, kind of trainings with some background work so that under, people understand the why you would want to use soy um, and, and the basics of how to use soy. But then really I think the big effect happens when people really work with the soy. Great. Um. Okay, another question I have is if you could explain a little bit more about the low processing soybean, and again why it's important. Um, the well, there are, that you, that right. You yeah, there are there are some low processing soybeans that are uh, being researched, and they have reduced levels of trypsin inhibitor, which is um, an anti nutritional factor that's common in many beans. So it's it's basically the trypsin inhibitor is is uh, something that um, inhibits uh, the trypsin enzyme in our digestive system, which makes it hard for our body to digest all of the, uh, all the nutrients available in the, in the foods. So when you have a low trypsin inhibitor or low TI beans, that means that there's less of those um, inhibitors to have to deactivate through our cooking. And so the research going on with the trypsin inhibitor right now is to introduce that into the beans um, so that when we go to cook with them, we don't have to cook so long, or that we can adapt our cooking processes to use less resources in, in the processing. Does is, is that, is that answer it? Yes, great. Okay, okay um, great. We have a question from one of our attendees, and I'm okay. sorry if I say the name wrong. I think it's Chimunya Bebe, and he wants to know, how does soybean compare with Bambara groundnuts? He understands that Bambara beans can be processed into milk as well, and would it be prudent to pursue the, um, the use of Bambara beans as well as given its adaptability to tropical environments um, with, you know, with regards to climate change? Right. Okay, well, I don't know specifically about the Bambara groundnuts. Um, I, I, and I, I actually don't know the specifics about like the amino acid profile in regular ground nuts. My suspicion is that they will probably be uh, lower in some of the, those essential amino acids we talked about. So they're going to have a lower PD-CAS score. Um, mm -hmm. But they, I, I mean, one easy solution is if you have really good recipes that are already using ground nuts that are very culturally accepted and and, uh, and like approved by the you know the the people there, um, the last thing we want to do is try to make a drastic change in when you're introducing something like soy soybeans 
to um, uh, affect the way things are tasting or perceived by your customers. So I would suggest, I mean, we, I, if, I, if I had the nutritional profile of the Bavaro ground nuts, we could play with some of that to see um, how well it would work with the soybeans because my suspicion is by adding some of the whole soybeans to your ground nuts and doing similar processing, we would probably end up with an even more improved nutritional profile. Um, but uh, I would have to bump it up to other people to talk to uh, to discuss uh, uh, how well we could blend ground nuts in with our soybean emphasis here. Great. Okay. Um, well, uh, just a quick reminder that we will be sending out the slides and the entire webinar out. Um, so if anyone you know has any questions with like further questions, we'll be sending those out and feel free to ask us. And so um, first we're going, now we're, thank you so much Marilyn for your presentation. Um, and we're going to move on to our first poll question before we get to heart with Malnutrition Matters. Okay. So everyone please feel free to uh, answer our poll question, that would be Great. And our first question is, what kind of packaging do you most commonly use or have seen for soy milk? Um, so you can select one or more of the following, and um, once you're done, we, we will share the results. All right, I'm going to close the poll, so in five seconds, if anyone else uh, is able to vote and then we'll share the results. Okay. So um, from our polls we have that 13% see same-day same distribution which would be no packaging, 69% um, have used or seen plastic bottles, 13% glass bottles, and 6% plastic bags. Great. Um, super helpful. Okay, so next is Hart Jansen, uh, the president of Malnutrition Matters, and he will be talking about soy dairy processing. Hart, whenever you're ready. Okay. Perfect. Thank okay, you. we're up and ready. Great. Okay, yep. so uh, Malnutrition Matters uh, has been in operation for 16 years and uh, our main objective is to improve nutrition uh, through local processing of soy and that uh, also um, we do that in a sustainable manner and that creates uh, also local employment opportunities uh, very often for uh, women in the community who may or may not also be uh, uh, smallholder farmers. Um, so we have worked very much in uh, rural areas of Africa and Asia, but, but uh, uh, our uh, system is also certainly uh, very much adaptable to urban environments and various levels of, of production. The other benefit of uh, using uh, soy for human consumption um, is that there's a very dramatic reduction in the greenhouse gas emissions uh, and use of land and water when you compare it to uh, consumption of animal protein and whether that is uh, meat or eggs or, or dairy milk. And as, uh, as was mentioned before, uh, Malnutrition Matters has assisted in implementing over 270 uh, small-scale soy processing sites around the world. Uh, you can you can see here uh, an example of one of our systems that's in a village in western Kenya. Uh, you see part of the system here with the uh, the pressure cooker and a, a fresh batch of, of soy milk uh, being being filtered. Um, so one of our objectives is to improve nutrition, and the highest rates of malnutrition are most often found in rural areas, and that's why we we uh, have have as our focus uh, rural processing um, and we do have we have different uh, 
we have different systems. Our VitaGoat system is a non-electric system, so it can be installed really in any remote location and in a very basic environment. Doesn't require electricity. Doesn't require running water. Um, and that enables this production again to be very local to uh, areas with high malnutrition. Um, Marilyn mentioned before that uh, soy for human consumption is is very low cost. Um, where we have in many locations experienced that you can produce and sell um, an eight ounce cup of soy milk or a quarter of a liter of soy milk. Uh, for about five cents a cup, um, and that gives you, in, in one of those cups, you get about seven, seven or eight grams of, uh, of protein. So it's it's a, like a, the most economical source of protein uh, that that can be produced. And you can also add micronutrients to the soy milk. Um, we have done projects where we add a bulk micronutrient mix um, at the cost of only one quarter of a cent per dose, so that's very cost effective. Um, this shows uh, the sites that we have uh, implemented around the, around the globe and you can see that many of them uh, are in uh, various regions of Africa. We're installed in, in 16 or 17 countries in Africa as well as uh, South Asia and uh, uh, Southeast Asia. Here you see a picture of one of our phyta goats in Liberia, in Africa. Um, and again, this is a non-electric system. It uses firewood as fuel, but you can also use other biomass like corn, corn husks or rice husks. Um, and again, we use a pressure cooking method. So even if the water source that we have isn't clean, um, the cooking up to 120 degrees Celsius uh, sterilizes the product. Uh, regardless of the uh, the water source, and again we can substitute the pedal uh, pedal powered grinder with an electric grinder if there's household electricity available, and also the multi fuel boiler can be replaced with an electric boiler if there is commercial electricity available. Uh, some examples of projects in Africa we've recently been working with the. International Institute for Tropical Agriculture. They've installed four of our systems and they are using them for training their agripreneur uh, 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 beneficiaries. Some of them are some of them are farmers, some of them are students. Um, and we have various other systems in in countries in Africa. Uh, we've recently been working with the Soybean Innovation Lab in Mozambique and Ghana. Um, we also installed some, some higher capacity systems in Mozambique uh, that can produce up to 80 liters of soy milk uh, per hour. And uh, we're seeing a lot of recent activity in, uh, in, in Ghana and are expecting to install quite a few more systems in Ghana this year. What you see here is a spreadsheet that we use uh, to estimate costs and revenues for our soy milk uh, uh, enterprises. And we have here an example of a, uh, a VitaGoat that's operating in Kenya. And uh, we will make this uh, spreadsheet available to, uh, to the attendees. When you get your presentations, you'll also uh, receive this spreadsheet. So in this example, we see that we have five hours of production a day and nine, uh, only nine days in a month uh, in this instance. Uh, but in spite of not operating every day, uh, they're still making a profit of about $440, and that's in US dollars. Um, and with a higher production, of course, there, there's a higher profit available. And in this case, we see mainly yogurt being produced because that's in high demand in, in Kenya. Um, and it also yields quite a high profit. Uh, so this spreadsheet is modifiable for different product mixes and again, different costs and different uh, revenue levels. So that concludes my presentation. I just want to point out that we also 
uh, do our work with partners. We couldn't we couldn't function without partners, um, and we have uh, various partners from uh, again our our soybean innovation lab partners, but also uh, such agencies as the African Development Bank, the World Bank, but but even we also work with small uh, church-based organizations that sponsor some of our pro uh, projects. So we work with a lot of different types of partners around the world. And I will uh, now take any questions that you might have. Great. Thank you, Hart. That was great. Um, okay, so we have a couple poll or chat questions. Um, the first one is from Gilbert Sinju. And he would like to know what is the cost of the system and where can they acquire, acquire it, one for a pilot project? Okay, so the cost of uh, the systems, it, it varies between uh, $5,000 and $6,000 US. Um, but I would just point out that, you know, that is uh, relatively expensive, but these systems can produce uh, between 150 liters and 200 liters per day. Um, or even more if you really want to operate it in multiple multiple shifts per day. So you can get over a thousand servings um, in, a, in a single day. Um, so in a, in, a, in a market where you have high demand, uh, you can you can pay pay for the system from your profits in, in, in a year or less. Um, and in terms of uh, source, uh, malnutrition matters uh, engages uh, fabricators in different areas of the world. Currently we have uh, three fabricators, uh, one in India, uh, one in Thailand, um, and one in Myanmar, but the Myanmar one is really only for local uh, uh, local usage, so, so for international sales um, we use either our fabricators in India or Thailand, so the if you buy one of our systems uh, shipping costs, of course, would be in addition to the uh, cost of the cost of the system. Great. Um, and then, is there a different? Uh, this is a question from Betty Bugusu. Um, is there a difference between? Uh, is there a difference in cost for installing the soy cow? Or does that seven thousand? Or you know, the estimate that you gave does that include right. the installation as well? And um, how do individual processors or aspiring processors get financing for startups? Right. So, uh, first of all, uh, the costs that I mentioned before do not include installation and training. Um, so, depending on your location and your uh, situation, um, we, we have contractors that we work with in, uh, in various parts of the world. We have staff that we can call on in various parts of Africa uh, and in India and in in, uh, in Myanmar to do training. Um, so the actual cost would not involve like an international or or a, a travel from North America. We can we can send someone uh, mm -hmm. in our in our local regions um, and. Uh, as far as financing, uh, again, uh, we are a nonprofit. We don't have an independent source of, of financing ourselves, so we can we can help uh, any any organization that would like to acquire uh, a soy cow or a vita goat. Uh, I mean, we have we have uh, material that you could use in a proposal to a to a donor or a funding agency uh, that that. Could help you secure that secure that funding. Great. Um, and then last question. Um, and again, if we don't get to everyone's questions, we will try to uh, get back to them at the open Q and A at the end. Um, and so this is from Chimunya Bebe, and he said, "Nice presentation, Hart. He wants to know if it's possible to have the soy cow systems uh, handle more than one crop." Um, we, the, the soy cow, the, uh, again, this, and this is, so this would be an electric 
system. They are really specialized primarily for soybean. Again, it, we have we have uh, done trials where we process things like uh, almonds or oats to to make uh, to make milk, and that that is possible. Um, but each each commodity that you use uh, has its own uh, processing uh, specifics, so you have to you have to use a slightly different process. Um, the uh, the bite goat system uh, is is actually a little more versatile. We've used the the a pedal powered grinder to we can process different uh, different grains uh, and also fruits and vegetables so that we can make uh, things anywhere from tomato juice, apple juice, uh, and and even like vegetable uh, stews with the with the system. But again, our our primary focus is on soybean because of the uh, the increased protein uh, that is vital uh, to address malnutrition in, in the areas that we operate. Excellent. Um, great. So I know that we got a couple more questions in, and again, I'm going to save those for the end. But um, really great questions, everyone. Keep sending them in. And um, Part, thank you so much for your presentation. We're going to move on to the second poll question, and um, then we will move on to PNBS. And so thanks again, Hart, and let me open up the poll. Okay. Uh, so the next poll question is, which soy dairy production input is most difficult to acquire? Soybean, a flavor, sugar, electricity, water, and um, maybe if there's one on here that we don't have, if you want to chat in your responses, that would be great as well. Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to close the poll now. And results. Um, so 31% said that soybean was the most difficult to acquire, 15% said flavor, 46% uh, said electricity, and 8% said water. Um, thank you everyone for your response to the poll questions. And great. Now we are going to... Um, Here from PNBS, and uh, these are our friends from Colombia, and um, we already did their presentation, and it was in Spanish. So we've added English subtitles to their to their presentation, um, and then we will do a live Q and A with them after they share the presentation. And so. Um, Great. And so, Dan, whenever you're ready to play that video, that would be great. Bueno. Eh, buenas tardes para los compañeros, compañeras de Illinois. Eh, mi nombre es Elizabeth Parisi, subdirectora del programa nutricional basado en soya del Club Rotario Bogotá Laureles. Eh, es muy grato para nosotros estar aquí presentes y transmitirles nuestras experiencias del PNBS. Muy buenas tardes, mi nombre es Pedro Manrique, soy el coordinador operativo, somos un equipo de trabajo, lo cual aunamos esfuerzos para que los resultados en nuestras plantas sean muy objetivos y sean realmente de fortalecimiento y rendimiento para las comunidades. Bueno, para adentrarnos en el tema eh, ya respecto a la soya, eh, vamos a hablar de las claves para el éxito de los emprendimientos en las plantas procesadoras de soya, la soy cow o vacas mecánicas. Primero nosotros eh, hacemos una caracterización de la comunidad, identificamos el perfil asociativo, la ya trayectoria, la formación, la aptitud y la actitud que tienen las comunidades para poder involucrarse dentro del proyecto. En segundo paso, hacemos un estudio del mercado, ¿qué quiere decir? Hacemos, un, hacemos una encuesta sectorial del sector para mirar el conocimiento sobre el consumo de la soya, quiénes estarían dispuestos a consumir la soya, por qué la consumirían, si conocen la historia saludable y nutricional de la soya, o si, o si definitivamente solo por curiosidad la quieren consumir. Y también cuál es nuestra comunidad objetivo, con los dos enfoques, el enfoque social de dar un, 
un alimento nutricional y un enfoque comercial de vender un producto nutricional saludable. Otra de nuestras claves es la viabilidad en la elaboración de los productos y comercialización de los mismos. Miramos eh, dónde, dónde se va a instalar la planta de soya, con qué tipo de población, eh, qué constancia tiene la población, si es viable colocarla o no colocarla en, en el sitio donde no la están solicitando. Y también miramos la parte del entorno para la posible comercialización de productos que salgan desde la planta procesadora de soya. En el siguiente paso vamos a encontrar lo que es la evaluación del perfil de negocio. Esta evaluación reúne absolutamente cada uno de estos pasos, de estos estudios que hemos hecho. Y por último terminamos dándole la viabilidad al proyecto. En este perfil, por supuesto, se trata de minimizar el riesgo de que la planta quede inactiva o que fracase la idea inicial de negocio y de impacto social que tenemos. Una de las claves importantes es la entrega de la unidad productiva, en este caso la entrega de la planta procesadora de soya en comodato y la entrega de 300 kilos de soya como capital semilla para que inicien las labores. Posteriormente a esto se les dicta la capacitación inicial donde se les enseña a hacer todo el proceso productivo para sacar la ocara y la leche y posteriormente para la elaboración de los productos. Entre los desafíos comunes eh, del, PB, eh, del PNBS encontramos el contacto y la constancia que el personal debe tener dentro de la planta de trabajo en, la, en cuanto a la parte de operatividad. Tenemos también el rechazo del producto, ya que alguno de los miembros de la misma comunidad que está solicitando la planta eh, no le interesa consumir el producto o cuando ellos intentan buscar la comercialización para la autosostenibilidad de la planta, buscan un rechazo hacia el producto, es otro de los grandes desafíos. Luego vamos con el producto en sí. Se hace una encuesta del sector del entorno para mirar qué tipo de producto consumirían ellos, ya que nosotros en soya podemos manejar más de 50 productos diferentes, pero no en todas las plantas se consumen los 50 productos. Realmente las plantas terminan elaborando y posicionando máximo 6 productos de soya en el mercado en su entorno. Entonces hacemos la identificación del producto, luego hacemos la plaza eh, donde se va a comercializar el producto, luego hacemos el precio, la fijación del precio, en la cual es importante tener en cuenta la materia prima que se invirtió, los servicios que se, que se consumen o que se gastan, la mano de obra de las personas que, la, que laboran ahí, teniendo en cuenta que a esos no son empleados, son personas que donan su trabajo y donan parte de su conocimiento en la transformación de los productos de la soya, y por último, la promoción, las partes donde las vamos a vender, que es en el mismo entorno, en las plazas de mercado, en el voz a voz con los compañeros o en la parte turística, entonces ya en las avenidas con los turistas. La sostenibilidad del, del proyecto. La sostenibilidad se da desde la comercialización de los productos y la entrega de nuevos mercados. Es uno de los desafíos más grandes que enfrentan las plantas procesadoras de soya. Eh, lo logran. Eh, muchas veces buscando un padrino o un, un benefactor para que les pueda suministrar algunos insumos y la soya o a través de la venta de los productos. Otro desafío que se da es la consecución de la materia prima porque en nuestro país se consumen 900, se producen, perdón, eh, 60 mil toneladas de soya y se consumen 900 mil toneladas de soya. Entonces esto hace que en ocasiones la materia prima falte o sea un poco más costosa por la importación. En cuanto a los tipos eh, de embalaje que utilizamos eh, o que utilizan las plantas dentro del programa nutricional basado en soya son, primero tendríamos que hablar de empaque, que son las, bol las bolsas o los envases plásticos eh, donde se empacan los productos y posteriormente el embalaje son las cajas de cartón, las canastillas plásticas, las cajas de copor o cajas de madera donde se empacan para la entrega ya a los beneficiarios o para la comercialización del producto. El tiempo de, de caducidad del producto, nosotros lo tenemos contemplado, la leche de soya en cinco días, la ocara en cinco días, los productos de panadería 15 días, los productos de repostería 8 días, los productos cárnicos 8 días, los productos lácteos 5 días. Los productos se elaboran en la mayoría de las plantas procesadoras de soya, 
eh, pues estos no llevan preservantes porque son entregados directamente a los beneficiarios o vendidos directamente, son totalmente naturales. Entonces, por eso en este momento nosotros no estamos utilizando preservantes en los productos. Eh, los tipos de esterilización que manejamos para los productos son las buenas prácticas de manipulación, las DPM, que se manejan acá con el Ministerio eh, de Colombia, y en algunas plantas ya tenemos los registros sin vima. Eh, nosotros estamos haciendo el caminar en este momento para la elaboración de productos inocuos para el requerimiento de los productos sin vima. Los canales de distribución que manejamos, como estábamos hablando desde el principio, es en el, en el entorno muy cercano. Por lo tanto, una bicicleta, una motocicleta, un automóvil, una camioneta, a veces caminando nomás, se puede entregar ya el producto porque realmente es muy cerca, es muy en el entorno. Eso hace que para las comunidades sea más cómodo la elaboración, la comercialización y la preventa de los productos en la elaboración. Los tipos de productos que se fabrican en las plantas de soya del PNBS son productos de la línea de panadería, de cárnicos y de lácteos. Generalmente cuando los eh, proyectos o las personas de estas comunidades se quieren ya especializar, les entregamos equipos y les eh, dictamos las capacitaciones para la elaboración de estos productos. Los programas están dirigidos a la primera infancia, al adulto mayor, a madres gestantes y lactantes, a personas desplazadas del conflicto armado y personas reinsertadas a la vida civil de los grupos armados en Colombia. Entonces, eh, pues de esta manera como breve, hemos presentado como nuestro programa en cuanto a la parte de emprendimiento empresarial. Quedamos pues eh, con las puertas abiertas para las preguntas que a bien tengan a hacernos y poder replicar el programa en las zonas que ustedes pues consideren sea necesario llevar, llevar este programa nutricional basado en soya. Te queremos agradecer Cristal por eh, esta oportunidad y por poder compartir nuestra experiencia de Colombia. Eh, les agradezco mucho este espacio, estamos de verdad muy satisfechos y la idea es que conozcan un poco más de cómo se maneja el proyecto de la soya en Colombia y es ese, sin olvidar que nosotros entregamos las plantas procesadoras, las vacas mecánicas con dos enfoques, el enfoque social para combatir la desnutrición en comunidades vulnerables o en riesgo de desnutrición y que no tienen en estos momentos la solución económica para la compra de los productos y la comercialización lo que hace un proyecto productivo autosostenible en cada comunidad. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias, Elizabeth y Pedro. Um, thank you. Pedro and Elizabeth for your presentation. Um, so they focused on entrepreneurship and how they they view entrepreneurship with within PNBS. Um, so we have a couple questions. So I'm going to ask the questions in Spanish, and so we'll be translating a little bit back and forth. Um, but then I'll reply in English. So uh, Pedro y Elizabeth, una pregunta de uno de nuestros um, tenientes es cómo preparan la ocara y cuáles son algunas de las comidas que pueden usar la ocara oh, no. espera a ver ok elisa okay. ok thank you eh, buenos días la ocara nosotros la preparamos dentro del proceso. Nosotros tenemos siete pasos para obtener la masa y la leche. Inicialmente nosotros hacemos todo el proceso de, de hidratación y de cocción de la soya. Posterior a, es, posterior a esto lo llevamos a la máquina, a la vaca mecánica, donde nosotros por cada 18 litros de leche utilizamos 3, eh, 3 kilos de de gran cocinado de soya y lo procesamos eh, durante cinco minutos. Posterior a esto separamos masa y separamos leche, o cara y leche. Eh, esa es la forma como nosotros obtenemos la cara, licuando todo el grano y separando el líquido del sólido. Eh, con la cara nosotros realizamos todas las líneas de panadería, la línea de cárnicos. ¿Esto qué quiere decir? Que involucramos la cara eh, dentro de los eh, panes, dentro de la repostería, dentro de los postres, dentro de todos los productos que nosotros eh, realizamos de panadería. 
y también involucramos la ocara en los productos cárnicos como son las hamburguesas, como son las albóndigas, los productos de embutidos. De esta forma nosotros estamos utilizando la ocara y prácticamente con nuestro proceso no se desperdicia absolutamente nada. Ok, um, voy a traducir. I'm just going to uh, summarize. So the question was um, how... Do they, how do they make okara or where does okara come from and what are some of the foods that they use okara in and so uh, the okara is a byproduct of the soy milk process and so uh, once, once they've made the soy milk um, the okara separates and then they, they dry it and so uh, in PMBS they have all different kinds of products Um, as you may have seen from the presentation, where they include okara, and so these include different uh, bread or bakery goods, pastries, um, meats, and so they, they include it in all, of, all areas of food and don't let anything go to waste. Um, okay, and then another, another question is, um, can you describe an example of of a success project and describe why it was, why it was successful. Uh, otra pregunta es si pueden dar un ejemplo de un proyecto exitoso y por qué fue exitoso. Sí, eh, uno de los ejemplos que tenemos exitosos es un comedor comunitario que existe en una comunidad que se llama Manizales, es como es un departamento de nuestro país. Allí eh, la comunidad se llama Nutri Infantil. Ellos realizan alimentos para 10.000 niños eh, de toda la zona de este departamento, entregándoles eh, productos eh, que, elaborados con soya en el refrigerio, en los almuerzos y en, en las, por ejemplo, lo que más entregan con soya son las galletas. Pero ellos mm. involucran todo el proceso de la soya, ellos tienen una vaca mecánica, les dimos capacitación y ellos aprendieron a involucrar la soya dentro de los productos que elaboraban. Tienen registros sin BIMA, permisos del Ministerio de Salud y están atendiendo actualmente 10.000 beneficiarios solo en esa zona. Wow, ok. Gracias. Quiero aclarar que el alimento que se entrega es diario. Se entrega oh, okay. de a viernes. Okay. ¿Y es por 10.000 niños diez cada mil. día? Cada día. Wow. Súper. Um, solo estoy anotando. <laughs> um, great. So, uh, again, the question was, what's an example of a successful project? Um, and so they have a uh, community feeding program, and it's called... Uh, Nutria Infantil, which is like for kids, and so, um, and it's a department within uh, within a community, and they feed over 10,000 kids per day, and this is Monday through Friday, and the soy cow has been able to uh, make all different kinds of products with um, the soy milk and the okara, and th these, um, so they feed them with They feed snacks and lunches, and the most popular product that they make is cookies. And this soy cow is registered with um, their version, their country's FDA. And um, yeah, so they feed 10,000 students. That's great. Um, okay, let me check my questions one more time. Um, okay, uh, otra pregunta es. Oh, they move the seed learning, yes. Okay, another question from a panelist, from an attendee is, in what, in your opinion, what do you think accounts for the rejection of the products? Okay, otra pregunta es, um, ¿por qué creen que algunas comuni comunidades tienen, eh, o sea, no les usan el, el producto o tienen la región? ¿Cómo se dice? Sí. 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 Eh, algunas comunidades rechazan el producto de la soya algunas comunidades rechazan el producto de la soya porque no 
eh, tienen la cultura del consumo. En nuestro país no había la cultura del consumo de la soya. Tú sabes que este es un producto eh, de, origen, eh, de origen oriental. Entonces, uh -huh. te vemos... Eh, ¿Puedo te decir rápido? Okay. <laughs> Porque es para que okay. puedan entender todo. Ok, so, uh, we're going to translate sentence by sentence. So, um, one of the reasons why there's the rejection of products is that they don't have the culture um, of soy in their, in their country because it's a product, it's originally from the East. ¿Qué hemos hecho nosotros como programa, como PNBS, para empezar a generar la cultura del consumo de la soya? Eh, estudiamos, investigamos lo que consume cada región en Colombia, sus costumbres alimentarias, qué les gusta, qué es lo que más se consume en la soya, y enseñamos a involucrar la soya dentro de estos productos para que sea de más fácil acceso y mejor gusto para los consumidores. Okay, um, so what they do is they do expansive food studies, um, and sensory studies, wherever they're going to have a soy product, uh, soy cow project, and they um, study what the people like to eat and how they cook, and then they figure out how to incorporate soy within those foods. Um, great, okay, bueno. Eh, hay otras preguntas, pero los voy a reservar para el, para el fin, para que podamos tener más, otra pregunta o otra poll question y después vamos a abrir para todos. Ok, so, um, yeah, we have a, a lot of other questions to get to, but I just want to get to our last poll question and then we will open up the webinar for open Q&A with all of our panelists. So please feel free to get, send in your questions and any questions we don't get to, um, we can try to email you a response. Okay, and then our last poll question is, what topics would you like to see covered in future Soy Cow Network webinars? Um, so we have business plan development, scaling up and automation, new product development, food safety and regulatory compliance, and hygiene, and packaging, storage, and logistics. And again, if there are, uh, if there's something on there that, if you would like to see something that's not on there, please feel free to chat in your response. All right, great. Okay, so the results from our quick poll are 71% would like to see business plan development, 24% would like to see scaling up and automation, 53% uh, would like to see new product development, 41% would like to see food safety and regulatory compliance and hygiene, and 59% would like to see packaging, storage, and logistics. Um, wonderful. So thank you so much for all your responses. These are super helpful in helping us um, develop our materials for our upcoming webinars. The hide these. Um, great. Okay, I think we have all of our panelists and. I'm going to add Peter, uh, if you could join the Q open Q&A as well. Great. Okay. Um, okay, so we have a lot of questions. So again, if we don't get to them all, uh, we will try to respond via email. And again, we're going to send out all the presentations uh, with additional resources as well as the entire webinar. Um, great. Okay, so the first question is for Hart. And he wants to know if there is an opportunity to have a soy dairy processing project being extended to Zambia. And this is from Alamu at IITA. Um. Okay, that's yeah, that's a great question. Um, 
I would suggest we, we have we have about a dozen uh, vita goats and soy cows in Zambia uh, now. Um, there are a number of uh, agencies that are uh, agencies and and very and entrepreneurs that are operating these systems. Uh, we previously worked with uh, Africare in Zambia, um, but I would very much welcome uh, the opportunity to work with IITA and uh, perhaps you know we can together uh, put together some kind of proposal uh, that we can introduce to someone internal in in IITA and, and of course uh, Malnutrition Matters has worked with their 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 head office uh, uh, people um, so maybe we can uh, work jointly together to suggest uh, that Zambia would be a you know a, an excellent location for uh, another uh, soy cow site. Excellent. Um, our next question is for Dr. Goldsmith. In the countries where they have implemented soy cows, how can we ensure its sustainability? Yeah, that, that's, that's a great question. And um, I think more work uh, in understanding uh, when and why um, uh, soy cow enterprises are sustainable, it, that, that uh, investigation is very necessary. I thought the um, the discussion by our colleagues in Colombia uh, really expressed it well, the, the kinds of full systems that um, need to be in place to make a, an enterprise successful, meaning demand, uh, source the raw material, uh, credit or financing, because once the uh, capital, uh, the original donor capital is exhausted, um, procuring soybean or procuring other inputs, flavors, and so forth uh, um, is, is important. So it's a full system approach, and I think based on the poll question as well, um, uh, we will uh, really emphasize in, in the near term for the network uh, business planning and, um, and all that entails. So um, having a good business plan is critical. Uh, the components of a good plan um, need to be well understood, and uh, and that's what makes for uh, really sustainable enterprises. Great. Uh, next question, and uh, maybe we'll open this up to Hart first, and then PMBS, and then Dr. Wilson. So, what are you know some of the key impacts of uh, the soy dairy projects so far? Just to kind of rehighlight that. Um, right. In our in our experience, I mean, the key impacts are improved health in in you know the consumers of the product. And again, depending on whether it's a humanitarian project uh, that is is donor funded or it's a uh, completely self sufficient micro enterprise or some combination thereof, uh, that that has been the most you know uh, dramatic and beneficial impact. Uh, where you see a community with uh, significant rates of malnutrition, uh, when these children receive, or children or or adults in the community receive uh, soy milk, especially when it's fortified with micronutrients, uh, the difference, you know, in their healthy development is is really noticeable. Um, the other significant impact is, you know, creation of employment. Um, you know, in the smaller rural communities, there's really very limited. Uh, employment opportunities, and uh, you know, again, a sustainable microenterprise can create three or four or five uh, five new jobs in the community, and it makes a real difference in the life of the families uh, where those uh, you know those workers are earning an income. Excellent, um, Elizabeth y Pedro, si podían dar para resumir unos impactos principales de PNBS. Los impactos principales del beneficio son en este momento nosotros tenemos 146 plantas instaladas en todo Colombia. Estamos atendiendo 64,400 beneficiarios. El 80% de estos beneficiarios son eh, niños, niños y niñas y adolescentes. Eh, también tenemos plantas instaladas, una en Guatemala, en un colegio de niñas. Tenemos una en El Salvador 
y estamos en este momento queriendo impactar en la Ciudad de México que están muy interesados en replicar nuestro programa. En general este es nuestro impacto hasta el momento. En el Perú nosotros eh, instalamos eh, dos plantas de soya, capacitamos dos comunidades muy vulnerables y se organizó allá una empresa que se llama Pansoy. Ellos en la actualidad tienen 18, 118 plantas replicadas con nuestro proceso en toda la comunidad del Perú. Ok, gracias. ¿Y cuántas personas dijeron que sirven? 34.400 beneficiarios tenemos en la actualidad. 4.400. Atendidos diariamente. Ya, Ibusha. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, great. So, PNBS has um, over 146. So, oh, sorry. The question was just some of their uh, key impacts or principal impacts that they've had through their program, and uh, they have various. So, it has uh, over 146 in Colombia. They've helped through start their own version of PNBS um, as well, and. We have a couple of soy plants in Guatemala and El Salvador, and 80% of people that they serve are children. Um, great. Okay. Cristo. Sí. En cuanto a impacto de producción, eso es en cuanto a impacto de beneficiarios y plantas mm -hmm. instaladas. En cuanto a impacto de producción, nosotros producimos en una hora 108 litros de leche de soya y 40 kilogramos de okara. Es la producción estándar que tiene nuestra máquina en una hora. Mm -hmm. Ok, and they, their soy cows produce uh, 180 liters of soy milk per hour and up to 40 kilograms of okara, which is great. Um, ok, our next question is for Marilyn. And she, this is from Hans Campbell, and they would like to know, they say that soy is rich in oil and protein. The soy processing discussed appears to focus only on protein. What happens with the oil component? Well, when it comes to the soy dairy processing, that oil is staying within the milk and in the, uh, possibly in the okara. So it's, it's not being pulled out as a separate uh, byproduct or a co-product co with, the, with the protein. And that's just the nature of the soy dairy. Um, I'm, I'm sure that a, a more sophisticated, uh, large commercial enterprise, they possibly have a way of pre-processing the soybean to pull out that oil before they make the milk out of it. I, I don't know for sure. Hart might know that. Uh, but as far as the soy dairy is concerned, um, that oil is staying within the soy dairy. Um, and then there are other products that aren't really the topic of this, of soy dairy. Um, there are other soy products that are oil-free or have had some of the oil extracted and so that the market um, or the commercial enterprise can make use of that oil as a, as, a, um, as a product for sale. But as far as the soy dairy is concerned, the, the oil is being retained within the, the okara and the soy milk. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, another question is from Boaz Waswa, and this is for Hart. Um, for the equipment using fuel wood, how do you balance between the already scarcity of the wood at the household with the use in soybean processing? And what, what of the smoke and environmental concerns? Right. Um, so... Again, our multi-fuel boiler, uh, again, we can use firewood, we can use other uh, fuels, <clears throat> as I mentioned, like any, anything that is, is uh, flammable. Uh, so if you have uh, uh, byproducts from farming, like I say, like corn husks or corn stalks uh, uh, that, that uh, can burn, anything else uh, can, can be used. Um, and we, we have worked in areas where, yes, firewood is, is quite scarce, um, so it's really a balance between uh, 
the most economical fuel available. So uh, again, we can use we can use bottled gas as a fuel. Again, that's also uh, relatively expensive, uh, but there there needs to be some fuel used. Uh, our system, though, is very fuel efficient. Um, you know, the firebox um, has a you know a, a means where we can control the uh, the the air being fed into the fire so that we have uh, the least amount of smoke and of course we have a chimney to take the smoke away from the operations area so that it does not affect the health of the workers at all um, but yes inevitably there will be some smoke produced uh, in in the production um, uh, but again uh, even though smoke is produced like firewood is a a renewable, uh, a renewable fuel. Uh, it's it's uh, not a fossil fuel. Um, so again, it it really depends on the on the specific environment that you're in. Uh, what what fuel is the most uh, is the most economical? Thank you. Um, okay, next question is for PNBS, and the question is. What is the role to fund the purchase of inputs after the seed capital is exhausted? Y para Elizabeth y Pedro, eh, la pregunta es, ¿cuál es el papel del crédito para financiar la compra de los insumos después de que el capital inicial se ha terminado? Y si podemos traducir línea por línea, o frase por frase. Okay. Eh, bueno, las estrategias que se utilizan para que sea autosostenible el proyecto está lo fundamental en la comercialización. Es necesario que la comunidad empiece a comercializar para que esos ingresos comercializados se conviertan en compra para materia prima. Y es, la segunda estrategia es conseguir un benefactor, otra fundación o una organización que apoye el proyecto de esa comunidad. Eso les hace eh, la reinversión en la materia prima. Ok. Um... Voy a repetir la primera cosa rápida, ¿por qué no? Se lo voy a repetir, claro. La primera estrategia con la cual eh, se reinvierte claro. es la comercialización. Entonces, que esa planta procesadora comercialice los productos y de esos ingresos vuelve y se compra la materia prima. Y la segunda estrategia es que la comunidad de la planta procesadora consiga, o, sí, consiga un, un beneficiario o un donante para que le aporte eh, lo financiero en la compra de la materia prima siguiente al capital semilla. Okay. Um, again, the question was, uh, what is the role of credit to fund the purchase of inputs after the seed capital is exhausted? And um, for them, they reinvest the sales from their products from commercialization back into the soy. Dairy is one strategy, and then a second strategy is to find a donor benefactor who will cover the, the rest of the input costs. Um, great. Okay, so yeah, there were a lot of questions we couldn't get to, so sorry, but thank you for all your great questions. Um, Dr. Goldsmith is going to wrap up the webinar, and again, we will be sending out all of the, the webinars additional resources, all the presentations, and try to get to your questions as well after uh, the webinar. So thank you, and Dr. Wolfman. Yeah, uh, thanks, Crystal. I, I want to give a, a virtual applause to uh, our speakers at MBS and Hart in Maryland. Fantastic job. Um, we will um, answer the questions, uh, post them on the website, post the, um, uh, the slides. Uh, make those available. The session has been recorded. That will be available. Uh, and of course, any uh, uh, follow-up, uh, do contact us, uh, and we'd we'd love to um, learn more, work more, and and uh, we're here to to work with you. So I want to thank you. Until the uh, the next time, uh, there'll be more of these. And I want to thank our host and hardworking moderator, uh, Crystal. We uh, did an amazing job, uh, so many balls in the air, and then behind the scenes, 
Uh, we have our communications director, Dan Bugengardner, uh, who's uh, manning the desk, and Courtney Tamimi managing uh, questions. So uh, team effort, and thanks, everyone. Until the next time, uh, take care. Have a great weekend. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.